Today we have with us uh, Mido Asran. He is a visiting researcher at Meta and um, he holds a one year scholarship and a VARA's uh, doctoral fellowship at McGill University uh, and Mila, the Quebec AI Institute led by Joshua Bengio, uh, as many of us already know. <laughs> so uh, Mido's research focuses on self-supervised representation learning and in particular learned feature extraction uh, from visual data for low shot prediction. Um, Mido also works in the space of education uh, with youth, teachers, and school boards, um, leveraging constructivist learning theories to introduce new learning pedagogies and introduce and, and improve school curricula. Um, so kind of self-supervised learning for kids, which honestly I'm I'm, I'm quite curious about this. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask you a lot about a lot of questions about this. Uh, but right now he's going to give us a talk on. Uh, his paper on label efficient representation learning, specifically the masked Siamese networks. So we're very curious to hear about it. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So I'll get started. Thanks for the uh, introduction. It's I mean it's really a pleasure to uh, to be here and get the chance to uh, speak with you. Uh, yeah. So maybe I'll just get right into it. Um, label efficient representation learning. Um, and my interest in this problem really stems from this hallmark of human intelligence. Uh, humans have this ability to efficiently learn to recognize uh, new objects from very few examples, okay? And so we'd like our artificial agents to be able to do the same, uh, but there's a caveat there, right? The ability uh, for humans to quickly become proficient in new tasks really depends on much of what we have learned prior to being faced with that task, um, okay? And so, you know, we're in this mode of, um, let me just describe the label efficient learning setup. We're in this mode where we wanna learn representations, for example, on unlabeled data. We have a lot of unlabeled data we want to learn representations that can be quickly adapted to a prediction task with few examples. Okay, and so if you're interested in representation learning, I, I don't think many people actually, I think most people actually agree with the statement. I think a good representation uh, should be able to adapt to prediction tasks with very few examples. You know, it's just for some reason our benchmarks are not really set up in this way, but you know, people generally agree about this. And I think, uh, so in this talk, I'll be focusing on kind of this setting where we have very few labeled examples uh, for our downstream task. I'm going to focus on image classification, although I think this problem is broadly way more interesting than just image classification and, you know, requiring many different tasks with different, uh, different levels of uh, semantic abstraction. Uh, but just, you know, for time and so on, I'll, I'll focus on image classification, but I think these ideas uh, can be extended. Uh, so today I'll be talking about kind of two recent works that really focus on this label efficient setting. So how we do representation learning and do well on a task where we have very few examples. Uh, so the first one is pause. Uh, so this is work that was uh, published at ICCD last year as an oral, uh, and then Mass Siamese Networks, our recent work, um, which is going to be presented at ECCB uh, later this year. And it's with my amazing set of collaborators, uh, you know, at uh, at Fair. Many of you maybe you've already met. I think some of whom have actually spoken here before. So uh, uh, yeah. yeah. So we'll get into it. So current approaches for label efficient representation learning, one kind of paradigm is to do self-supervised pre-training with no labeled data. So fully unsupervised pre-training phase. And then after that, you adapt your model either by fine tuning end to end, or you train kind of uh, a model on top uh, using the available labeled data you have. And so methods that fall under this framework are, for example, pretext invariant representation learning, SimClear, BYOL, Swab. I mean, of course there are way more, uh, but it's just a few to put on the slide. Okay, and so, I'll talk about it later. There are kind of a couple modern paradigms. One is based on joint embedding architectures, and another is based on you know now these ideas of mass denoising or a bit more kind of this generative flavor. Uh, of course, these methods have been around for a while, but they've gotten renewed interest. I'll talk about those a bit later. But right now, the approaches that really excel at semantic abstraction tasks are these joint embedding architecture approaches. Um, and so the general idea behind all of these methods, uh, they all kind of follow this principle. Uh, so, for example, given an image, you know, call that of a dog, for example, call that X. Uh, we're going to generate two views of that image using random data augmentation, such as, you know, random crops and resizing, flips, and so on. And then we're going to feed those to our encoder F and a small MLP G to get embeddings ZI and ZJ. And now, because these embeddings ZI and ZJ originate from, you know, the same image, all be different views, uh, we're going to want to maximize the agreement and say these things are semantically similar. Uh, now, obviously, there's a trivial solution here, which is your network could just output a constant vector regardless of the input. Uh, so that's where now all of these methods differ. All of the methods in literature, they vary in kind of how they do this maximize agreement and how they do this, uh, you know, prevent collapse. And it really comes down to like a, a volume maximization type principle. But, you know, there's 
they all have different subcategories and ways of doing it, but this is the general idea. Okay, now the problem with these approaches is they tend to be a little inefficient. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. So here, for example, uh, we pre-train a ResNet 50 on ImageNet. Uh, this triangle up here is just training a ResNet 50 fully supervised on ImageNet with 100% of the labels. And these circles here uh, were kind of state-of-the-art methods for self-supervised um, representation learning. And we pre-train on ImageNet in a fully unsupervised fashion. And then we fine-tune the model end-to-end -end on just 10% of the ImageNet labels. So clearly there's been a lot of amazing progress because we're using 10 times less data, but there's still a large gap, both in terms of accuracy, as you can see here, and in terms of pre-training epochs, we need much more compute. So that's the problem with these approaches. They're a little inefficient because they're not using any, uh, you know, they don't have any semantic signal during pre-training. Another set of approaches are, you know, semi-supervised pre-training. And there the idea is you use your both unlabeled and labeled data uh, to learn image representations. And then after that, you adapt your model using the labeled data that you do have. And so approaches that fall under this framework, um, some of them are quite popular. Maybe you've heard of pseudo labels, fixed match, unsupervised data augmentation, and meta pseudo labels, which was uh, a recent paper also by uh, Kofi's group. And uh, so all of these approaches, they have what they generally do is they have an unsupervised loss plus a supervised loss. And they try and weight them, and the creativity comes in how you design this unsupervised loss but they try and weight them in a way to avoid overfitting to the labeled data you do have, okay? The problem is they still tend to overfit with very few labels because if you're directly trying to predict ground truth labels and you know, you're in a very uh, setting maybe where you have like two images per class, it's, it's really hard. And so you have to be careful how you tune this weight and how you train and are you stopping them. Uh, so these methods, the problem is they kind of stop at a limit and then you know, fewer than that, a certain amount of labeled images, they tend to overfit. Uh, and so this is now where we presented pause. So pause is a method for representation learning. And here I'll talk about image classification results, but um, there's been a lot of interesting uh, works. I've been surprised by how people have uh, looking at extending this using uncreated data, uh, multi-label classification, uh, you know, other instance-based tasks and so on. Uh, so I'll talk about this for a second. And yeah, these are the collaborators on this uh, paper. Um, okay, so pause. The general idea, again, it's a joint embedding architecture type approach with a slight caveat. Okay, so you start with an image, for example, an image of a dog, and we're going to generate two views of that image. We're going to call one the anchor view and the other one the positive view or the target view. Okay, and then we're going to compute representations of these images, and then we're going to generate class predictions for these images. And now, because these two images again originate uh, you know, from the same image, albeit different views, uh, we're going to want to maximize the agreement. And how we do that is just minimize the cross entropy between these two, you know, the target and the anchor prediction. The interesting thing here, though, yeah, so clearly you can see where the inspiration from joint embedding architecture is, comes from. Uh, but the interesting thing is, is how we generate these predictions. Okay? And so remember, we're in a semi-supervised setting, so we have a very small amount of labeled information for our task. And so what we're going to do is we're going to sample a small mini batch of labeled images, and we're going to call those our support samples. So using kind of similar terminology to ideas in like future learning and so on. Okay, we're going to call those our support samples. And we have their labels as well. So XS here is you know, a mini batch of labeled images. And YS here are their corresponding one hot labels. Okay, so I, here I put some kind of, uh, you put it in Euclidean space. So YS, if you have B images and K classes, YS is a B by K matrix. Okay. Then we're going to compute the representations of these labeled images. Uh, and now to generate a class prediction for our anchor view, what we're going to do is just do a nearest neighbor's prediction with respect to our support samples. And it's a soft nearest neighbors, okay? So P here concretely is just, you know, two matrix products in the soft mats. Uh, if you're familiar with attention, you can actually think of this as cross attention. So Z here is your query, uh, ZS here are your keys, and YS here are your values. And so this prediction P is just a weighted average of your values, uh, where the weight given to each is proportional, right, to the cosine similarity between. So you can think of this as doing cross attention. And so now this provides an interesting interpretation of your support as a kind of episodic memory. So memory related to specific visual inputs. And now our objective is saying, you know, two views of the same image should activate the same elements in memory. That's really um, what we're saying. And again, because this is differentiable, right, this is like a soft attention, uh, you differentiate through everything. So you get gradient signal with respect to your unlabeled images, but also with respect to your labeled support samples. But we never directly predict ground truth labels so that we don't overfit. Um, and we have some theoretical guarantees. So I mentioned, you know, other methods in literature have ways for kind of heuristically preventing representation collapse. 
Um, here, actually, with the pause framework, we can prove that if you do class balance sampling, so regardless of your distribution of labeled images, if you sample images in your support in a class balance way so that you're not biased towards a particular class, and you sharpen your targets so that it's a bit kind of peaky, uh, that is provably sufficient to prevent representation collapse. And concretely, uh, what we actually show is that collapsing representations are not a stationary point uh, of the training dynamics. Okay. And I'm mean, happy to chat more about it also offline if you're interested. And so the overall training loss is you know, given a mini batch N. We just want to minimize the cross entry between our, our prediction and our target. Uh, and then we also have a regularizer. Um, it's not necessary, but it provides a lot of improvement in the extremely low shot setting. So P bar here is just the average of all your predictions. Okay. And there's a probabilistic interpretation. Happy going to uh, yeah. I'm just curious, how do you guarantee that the target will be P? Uh, we sharpen it. So, uh, for example, you can think of feeding it through a soft max with a temperature, mm -hmm. or you can think of just exponentiating it and renormalizing, uh, you know, or you can just take like a hard assignment. Um, so I should clarify here, we backpropagate through the anchor and the support, but there's a stop gradient here. Oh. So we think of this as a pseudo label almost, and, uh, you know, just as you wouldn't differentiate through a, like a, a label, here we treat it as a Label. So you can actually do whatever kind of sharpening you want here. You could literally just take it to be one hot. And uh, so this sharpening operation doesn't have to be differentiable. In practice, what we do is we just like exponentiate with the temperature and renormalize. And that, that actually works. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so the overall training loss, yeah, we average our predictions P. And then we want to maximize the entropy of P bar or equivalently minimize the negative entropy of P bar. And so what this regularizer is saying is on average, you want to use all of your kind of classes equally. Okay, it's an inductive bias in this case, um, not necessary for training to work, but really in the extremely low shot setting, if you have like 12 images, labeled images per class, it actually provides a non-trivial boost in uh, performance. Uh, okay, and so now how does this compare to previous methods? I'll actually start with this figure here on the right. Uh, so here we train a ResNet 50 on ImageNet where we have access to 10% of the labels. These circles here are previous self-supervised methods that are pre-trained and then fine-tuned end-to-end on the 10% labels. And these triangles here are these um, really state-of-the-art semi-supervised methods. So meta-pseudo labels, uh, there's like the meta-learning loss plus the supervised loss. I mean, they're actually quite interesting methods. But uh, so with pause, much simpler method, single objective, um, you know, with much less pre-training, we're able to get a non trivial improvement in, in performance. Now looking to the figure on the left here. Uh, so here, same setup, but we only have access to 1% of ImageNet labels, so about 12 images per class. And the reason you don't see the triangles here is that you know, these previous state-of-the-art methods were not able to go to that extremely low-label regime because of this overfitting problem, because they're directly predicting uh, ground truth labels. So the best methods here are the self-supervised methods that are pre-trained in a fully uh, unsupervised fashion. Uh, and so here with pause, again, we get you know, a large gain in performance with significantly less pre-training. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, and it comes from I think the labels are accelerating pre-training in a sense. Like you're providing extra signal to your model that's helping kind of accelerate convergence. Um, but if you did random labels, yeah, first, uh, that's a really good question. Um, so yeah, not a paper on this, but did explore at some point doing like what I call instance discrimination labels. Okay. So you can imagine in an unsupervised setting, you know, you don't have labeled images, but you still use the support and you just give them all uh, you know, unique labels, for instance, uh, that actually works to a certain extent, but you don't see the, uh, you don't see the, the speed up in that case. Yeah, yeah. You also provide something where instead of this instance discrimination, you did something with the flavor of the clustering methods, like take a few clusters to do so as your Oh, like interesting. Like a deep cluster style where yeah. you uh, cluster the methods, assign them labels, and then put those in the support. Exactly, yeah. uh, so try it something very, very briefly uh, where in an online manner, you would feed images, take their pseudo labels, and then add them in the in the support. Uh, and then just, you know, for some reason got distracted and didn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think something like that is interesting. I actually am aware of people exploring that kind of idea uh, with pause for uncurated data extending it to settings now where you care more about just a few set of classes, it's more open world, um, and you know, your labels, you might not have labels for all of the, you know, the concepts you care about. Um, but what's really interesting to me, and maybe I'll talk about this more after, is I think like going beyond kind of 
object classes and thinking more about doing this kind of attention or supervision for uh, you know, more different di different levels of kind of um, uh, semantic information. So um, yeah, I'll talk more about this, but actually it's, uh, you'll see it's a bit of a limitation actually. <laughs> uh, okay. uh, and now compared to supervised learning, so here we have a ResNet 50, ResNet 52X and a ResNet 54X. Uh, the dashed red line is the best supervised, uh, well, uh, so these baselines are taken from the SimClear paper. So they're, you know, they sweeped a bunch of data augmentations, hyperparameters and so on. So they're reasonably decent baseline. Uh, I'm not saying that's the best you can get, but I think they're pretty decent baselines. And so these dashed red lines correspond to supervised baselines with that specific architecture. Uh, and so, for example, here you can see pre-training with pause for 200 epochs with 10% of labels, which is this dark uh, dark line here. We're matching the performance of supervised learning with 10 times fewer labels using the same architecture. Uh, and again, we see similar trends for the ResNet 54x and larger architecture. So a ResNet 52x is just a regular ResNet, but where you double the number of filters and so you just widen the, the network. Um, so we're seeing actually pause was, you know, to the best of my knowledge, was the first method to match the performance of fully supervised learning on ImageNet uh, with 10 times fewer labels while using the same architecture. So we're not saying we need to use a much bigger architecture, much larger data sets, and look for matching. We're saying using the same exact uh, architecture and matching it. Uh, okay, so I'll sum up, but there are limitations to pause. Um, so, you know, we proposed pause, which was a simple method for semi supervised representation learning. Um, and you know, I, the representation learning part I think is is the interesting part because you want representations that can then transfer to many downstream tasks. Um, I only talked about classification, but I think that's you know, obviously we care way more about way more than just classification. Uh, yeah. So I was curious at the at the end of training mm -hmm. after you got to be conversion, does does it point to the right example? Like the, the dog really point to the dog? Uh, yeah, that's a great actually that's a really interesting result I didn't put in here, but um it's insanely good at non-parametric classification. Okay. So you take a ResNet 50 and say you do pause pre-training with 100 percent of image net, like 100 percent You do supervised learning, but using this framework. Uh, that ResNet 50 at the end gets 76% top one accuracy using nearest neighbors classification. So you don't have a head, it's fully non-parametric and it's getting, I mean, but that's what it's trained to do, right? It's trained to do non-parametric classification in a sense. And- um, Why do you think that though? It seems like it could, the dog, it could mm -hmm. do a similar to the dog or the back. Okay. Uh, what is the- Yeah, so I think the intuition here, for example, supposing your support set, uh, you, have, you have multiple classes, and then you have multiple instances from each class. And now say your you know, predictions are confident. So the learning signal you get back through your support is gonna to cluster together. Um, it's almost like doing supervised contrastive loss, but implicitly in your support. Um, so it's gonna to push together images from the same class if they have the same label, while pushing away the representations of images from different classes if they have different labels. And so this you know, value matrix here, this is what says, and you know, if you have like a million labels, uh, you know, a million label, yeah, a million classes, for instance. Uh, this YS here does not have to be a million dimensional. It just has to say which images in your support correspond to the same class. Mm -hmm. It's like saying, don't match up the images that have graphs in them. Mm -hmm. Use the labels we have to decide which one. Well, yeah, in a sense, it comes implicitly from that because you can imagine intra class variability. Uh, maybe you have multiple instances of dogs, but where the background is not kind of grass. Or, yeah. So, um, you know, by pushing together representations within that class, uh, you're going to learn to kind of ignore those uh, features that are not predictive of that category uh, in order to kind of collapse them together. Yeah. Why did you have like sub support images that are from different, very different sizes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like I said, uh, this was very interesting it was in the timeline and I for some reason got distracted, but I think um, I'm, I'm aware of some people kind of now exploring this in the uncurated setting. And I think that's really interesting, you know, um, uh, and I'll talk about it at the end, but I think one of the current problems in representation learning is, and maybe for dramatic effect, I think it's like the best kept secret in self-supervised learning, there's a curation gap. We think our methods are very general and they work very well on uncurated data. Um, you actually get a huge drop if you go from curated to uncurated data. And I think uh, figuring out ways to learn representation on uncurated data um, that transfer well, I think is, is an open, and I have a few ideas for this, um, but I think that's the right, those are kind of the right questions to ask, I think, and then 
extensions because image net is meant to be kind of a stepping stone it's not the ultimate goal but i think you know, as a, well but you know ironically next paper i'll also talk about image net <laughs> <laughs> uh okay but so pause was great we got a really um, amazing performance a simple method it's gotten some good uh, traction but a limitation is actually it's still possible to overfit in the extremely low label regime. So we're able to push kind of the amount of labeled images compared to previous semi-supervised methods. We're able to decrease it by an order of magnitude, uh, but there's still you know a gap there where we can overfit. And so I would say if you have you know 100 labeled images uh, per class or more, or 50 Im labeled images per class or more, uh, pause. I would say actually so today is a really great method to use for that. Uh, but what about this case here, where you have you know, one labeled images per, uh, per class or two labeled images per class? Um, because you differentiate through your support samples, it's still possible to overfit, even though you're not directly predicting ground truth. And so I'll discuss here representation learning in this setting, and that's mass Siamese networks. Okay, and so this is work again with you know, awesome collaborators. Um, and uh, and yeah, okay. So we mentioned there were kind of two common paradigms for self-supervised learning. I mentioned earlier we kind of saw these joint embedding architecture approaches. Um, and those are great. Right now, those are the best methods for kind of um, low shot tasks because they produce representations of a pretty good semantic level. Uh, there's also another recent class of methods based on mass noise and architectures. Um, so these actually have been around for a long time. Even uh, actually, I, stood, I think the specific uh, mass denoising task was proposed by Pascal Vincent in uh, you know, the Stack Denoising Autoencoders paper back in 2010 and Jay Moore. Uh, but so the idea behind mass denoising for representation learning is, you know, given an image, uh, you're going to apply mask noise. And what that means is you're randomly going to drop some of the patches from the image, feed that through an encoder. Here, the encoder is a vision transformer. Uh, and then through a decoder and try and reconstruct your input in pixel space. Okay. Uh, and the reason these have kind of received maybe a lot of renewed interest is because they tend to be um, actually pretty computationally efficient. Because in the case of a vision transformer, you only need to process the unmasked patches. So if you mask like 75% of your image, you only need to process really 25% of your image. And if you have a small decoder, it doesn't really add too much to your computational overhead. So these methods are pretty efficient, but the issue is that they produce representations of a pretty low semantic level. So they capture a lot of features, but the structure isn't there to be directly leveraged for tasks. Okay, and so you know, there's a lot of work building on this, you know, doing a patch or a patch level reconstruction, either in a pixel level or a token level. So what I mean by token level is some works, you know, they first embed the patches, you know, uh, so linear embedding or something, they call those tokens and try and reconstruct those. But so there's a general line of work doing patch level reconstruction. They work great, but the common thing is the semantic level of the representations isn't actually great unless then they do also add a joint embedding loss or something like that. And so an open question we want to ask is, can we get the computational advantages of masking without doing patch level reconstruction? Uh, and so that's where we propose mass assignments networks. Uh, it looks very similar to pause, except now it's fully unsupervised. So given an image, this is my dog buddy, by the way. He was, <laughs> yeah. So given an image of a dog, we're going to generate two views of that image. And then we're convert going to convert them into patches. And then we're going to randomly mask the anchor view by randomly dropping some of the patches. So we're going to feed it through our encoder, which in this case is a vision transformer. And then same as we did with pause, we're going to generate predictions and you know, force those predictions to match across views. Now, the difference is here, the support set uh, is not, um, does not correspond to the representations of labeled images. Uh, these are actually just, you know, uh, it's just a weight matrix. So you can think of each one of these prototypes as, you know, a learnable vector representing, you know, a cluster centroid, for instance. Okay, and, um, and these are learned. And so otherwise, though, um, yeah, the MSN loss is actually identical to the pause loss. Um, and so crucial to the strategy, though, is the masking. The masking is what really gives us very good low shot performance. And we explore two masking strategies simultaneously during training. So one is random masking, where we randomly drop uh, you know, non-contiguous patches across the image. And the other one is focal masking, where we pick a region of the image and drop everything around it. Uh, and it's interesting, both are actually complementary and do very different things and lead to very interesting representation properties. Uh, so just to be a bit more concrete, in each iteration, we sample B images, and then we're gonna generate M views of each image. And each view, you know, we're gonna apply some different mask to it. Sometimes it's random, sometimes it's focal. And then we're gonna generate a target view with no masking. And the idea is we're thinking of doing a mask denoising task, but at a representation level rather than a patch level. And this is what's going to give us higher level semantic representations. Okay. Uh, and now our loss is just you know minimize the cross entropy between your target and your anchor. 
average that across all M views and your batch size uh, B. And then similar to pause, we have a regularizer. We average our anchor predictions and maximize the entropy or minimize the negative entropy uh, of that average. And again, here now, what this regularizer is saying is just on average, you want to use all of your prototypes equally. So you want equal mass in all your clusters. Um, okay, and similar to pause, we actually have uh, theoretical guarantees here that if you use this regularizer in this case, so whereas pause, the regularizer was not necessary, here it's actually necessary for the non collapsing guarantees. So if you use this regularizer and you sharpen your targets, again, you can use any kind of sharpening strategy. Uh, here you will actually provably avoid representation collapse. It just won't be a station point of the training dynamics. Uh, yeah. So now in this case, the background is right? Uh, yes, but this is now where the data augmentation is. So we still rely on data augmentations. Right. Uh, so going back here, right? Uh, for example, here we apply color jitter. So this means the model cannot, you know, maximize these predictions by using, uh, you know, very simple color histograms of the images, like. Um, so that's still limitation, but I think I'll, I'll discuss some ideas going forward. I think there's a lot of ways to move beyond these handcrafted data augmentations, introduce features at multiple levels of uh, abstraction and so on. And, and these are all open questions. I think we're just um, kind of starting to scratch the surface, but at least with this work, you know, one thing we wanted to do was push the label efficient part because there's like lots of these self-supervised representation or methods, um, you know, state of the ones like MAE, for instance, mostly evaluated with a lot of labeled images. And, you know, that's interesting. But it's different than the goal here, which is you know, learn a representation that can be adapted to a task with very few labeled examples. So even though we do, I'm um, you know, proud of the accomplishments here, I, th I think there's still a long, a long way to go and a lot of work to do. Um, okay, yeah, so that's the loss. And here I'll just describe the setup. Again, pre-training on ImageNet. Well, we do have other results as well in the paper, but pre-train on ImageNet. And then we freeze the network, actually. And we just train a logistic regression classifier on top. And here is what we find. So before I was looking at a ResNet 50 with pause. Here I'm looking at literally, you know, just the best architectures, the best models, the best numbers out there for this task. So, you know, if you have ImageNet and only 1% of the data is labeled, the previous best model was Sync32, this large 800 million parameter ComNet with these selective kernels and attention built in. Uh, and it's fine tuned then to end. Now with mass Siamese networks using a vision transformer, uh, using a model that's an order of magnitude smaller. And again, the weights of the network have never been trained with any labeled data because the network is frozen and we just train a logistic regression classifier on top. We get almost about a 1% improvement in, in top one accuracy with a much smaller model. Um, and then we can also push this further. So here, um, here um, you know, for example, with 1,000 labeled images, this is just one image per class. So with only one image per class, we're getting around 60% top one accuracy. Uh, you know, with 5,000 labeled images, so only five images per class on ImageNet, we're getting around 73% top one accuracy, uh, much better than Dino. And the reason for that, if you're familiar with the Dino method, um, essentially this, this gain comes from masking. So masking introduces an additional kind of um, invariance and saying you want representations that are not too reliant on specific pixels, um, maybe it's a bit robust to occlusion and these kinds of things. So we end up discarding much more information. And compared to MAE, I said, MAE is actually great. If you have more labeled images, you can see it's increasing really fast. And if you have a lot of labeled images, I'm pretty sure actually MAE would surpass uh, these methods. But in the really low labeled data regime, it's hard to leverage those representations because the structure isn't, isn't there. There's a lot of features that are captured. Um, okay, and similar to the finding with MAE actually is by doing masking, we can significantly improve the computational overhead of training. So on the y-axis here, we have memory utilization per GPU. On the x-axis here, we have the masking ratio. So 0.7 here means we're masking 70% of the anchor image. And then the bubble size is here proportional to our throughput. And so all, you know, the point of this image is just to say, with more masking, you decrease your memory utilization. So you can actually train bigger models uh, and you train faster because these bubble sizes increase. And actually the side point, but what we find is the larger the model it is that you're training, the higher masking ratio you should use, uh, or the smaller your patch size, also the higher masking ratio you should use. So that was a finding that we had. Okay, and this is the interesting part now. Um, the thing about MAE and some of these kind of decoder-based approaches is you can directly visualize the representations because there's a decoder. Uh, with the mass Siamese network framework, we don't have a decoder, but you know we can still use this tool to visualize the representations. So there's this recent RCDM paper by Fernand Board. Um, and so we use this to visualize the representation. And the idea is, for example, given an image, for example, an image of a kangaroo, 
you compute the representation of this image using your model. And now what you do is you sample from a generative model conditioned on this representation and you get these samples. And so how do you interpret these? Uh, well, what's semantically common across these samples is what's encoded in your representation. And what varies across the samples is what's not encoded in your representation. Uh, so for instance here, you know, we take a representation of a kangaroo sample from a generative model condition on that. We find, okay, we've captured maybe some of the texture, uh, some of the shape, maybe just like the ears, uh, but what varies, for example, is the background. So that means it's not contained, the pose, it's not contained, uh, lighting. Uh, actually, apparently even the number of instances is not <laughs> encoded, two-headed kangaroo here. Um, okay, so that's how you interpret them. So now let's look at this with masking. So when we mask an image, what does the model see? Okay, so given here, this is the original image. Uh, this is the image with 50% of the patches masked. And then what we do is we take our MSN pre-training network, compute the representation of this masked image, and then sample from a generative model conditioned on this, um, on this image. Uh, and what you see is even with 50% of the patches masked, you still capture kind of the semantic structure or semantic information in the image. So we have this rooster, uh, you know, we have a kangaroo here, we have a bird. Okay, now compare it, for example, with Dino, a method that was not trained with this kind of mask invariance or mask demosing task. Uh, here, okay, you see it's still kind of captured, but a lot of information is lost. You have these artifacts. In the case of this bird, uh, you see it's not actually clear that you know, the concept of a parrot or this bird is captured. You've captured some of the color and so on. Uh, now, what if we go to the extreme case where we mask 80% of the patches? Okay, so here, 80% of the patches are missing. We compute the representation of this masked image and sample from a generative model condition on it. See, it's still actually captured, like here, it's actually still able to capture that there's some kind of bird present, or in the case of a rooster, you see it's still there, but we're not even encoding the number of instances. So here we have two roosters. Uh, the owl one is actually kind of interesting because by masking, we've gotten rid of the owl. Okay, so the samples don't have an owl in them, but it's captured some of the tree structure and so on, okay? Uh, by contrast with Dino, if you do this kind of level of masking, the model is not able to see anything in the image. So a lot of that information is lost and you kind of have these weird pattern-based backgrounds. Uh, the last kind of result I'll show is really interesting is looking at the prototypes. So just as you can visualize the representations, we have these prototypes and we can see what are the clusters, um, directly visualize what are these clusters that the network is learning. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, so the prototypes here are, are these, point, these vectors here. Uh, and what we find is the clusters, the prototypes are highly class specialized. Okay? Even though we, the model as weights themselves have never been trained with any labeled information. Yeah. So in this case, the prototypes are learned, but in the pause place, you're using labeled yeah. samples to fulfill that. Exactly. Role. So in the pause case, the prototypes here are the representations of labeled images. Right. And we say these representations of labeled images are what define our clusters. Right. Here in, in uh, MSN, it's unsupervised. So the prototypes are just learned vectors. Cool. Yeah, it's just a wave vector that's random initialized and learned throughout training. Oh, so it's not even like using real images and no. some function like that. It's no, no, like it's just a random sound. vector that you optimize with SGD. <laughs> yeah. I did you send a number of prototypes? Yeah, so um, what we found is, uh, yeah, and this is a bit on ImageNet. Uh, if you use over a thousand prototypes, doesn't matter how much, but if you use more than a thousand, performance kind of saturates. If you use too few prototypes, then you see a degradation in performance. So you need a lot of prototypes. Um, yeah, you need a lot of prototypes. But after a certain point, performance just saturates. It doesn't increase, but it kind of stays neutral. Why did we don't know the number of classes in the training table? Yeah, you just need an. I and to be safe, I would just add a lot of prototypes. <laughs> yeah, like for example, Dino, which is another popular method. Uh, you know, you can think of the last layer of that network as being the prototypes, and there, that last layer is sixty something thousand dimensional. So uh, I think if you use a lot of prototypes, it's a safe kind of one in doubt. Just throw more prototypes, maybe. Then many prototypes would learn the same same task. Yeah, maybe you would have redundancy, or um, actually, I, I, maybe you would also learn different features. Uh, Maybe you'd have some that are class specialized, and then in order to discriminate between the rest, they would correspond to different kinds of things. Yeah, yeah. I'm wondering if you ever found with the more than a thousand case, like oh, mm -hmm. this, these two prototypes are both the same class, but like this one's puppies and this one's adults. Yeah, you know, um, so this was actually, this is more than a thousand. I think these were 2000 something. And I just here took the first eight, um, didn't actually go through all. 
2000. We just took the first few and, uh, but all of the ones we looked at seem to be class specialized, but it's possible that maybe you have some redundant encodings. Maybe you have multiple prototypes specifying the same encoding. Uh, and uh, yeah, so what we see is like, you have one prototype just for you know, digital handheld devices, another one for snails, my personal favorite human in a lab, I guess. Uh, <laughs> Um, and these are not cherry picked. I just took the first few, and all of them seem to be kind of have this really interesting property. Uh, okay, so in short, because no, exactly, yeah, yeah. And so, same generative model. It's at this point, it's frozen. We're just doing inference. It, it's a diffusion model, right? um, but it's frozen, and we're just doing inference. And the only difference between these rows is which prototype we're conditioning on, mm -hmm. and. Um, Okay, and so in short, we proposed mass Siamese networks for that extremely low shot setting. And so we said, in the art for image net in that setting, uh, the masking significantly reduces training time. So it really allowed us to train bigger models on the same hardware uh, in much less time and provably avoids collapse. Uh, but there are limitations. Um, so we saw, for instance, you know, in our visualizations that we're not even storing, I mean, the model is not encoding the number of instances. That's a problem for tasks where you need to know the number of instances of, you know, uh, more instance level tasks and so this is a bit of a limitation we found that maybe it's a bit obvious but in order to be good at low shot tasks you really need to discard a lot of information and that's really the point of representation learning this semantic abstraction but still uh to be good you need to discard a lot of information because otherwise the problem is too ill-defined right if you have one image per class there's a million ways to map from your representation to your label so the more information you can discard while kind of retaining the important information the better you do at that low shot task but it's a trade-off the more information you discard there, the worse you might do on other tasks. Uh, and so in short, I think these kinds of present, uh, these kinds of uh, trade-offs present really interesting future directions. So how do you obtain representations that excel at many low shot tasks? And I really want to emphasize the, the low shot part. Like I think you can look at tasks of many different levels of abstraction, uh, but still keep the low shot part, you know, where you don't have a lot of labeled examples, um, because I think that's a cleaner way to kind of test um, you know, the quality of your representation. And secondly, is how do you improve training with uncurated data? Um, and not shown here, and, you know, people don't talk about it as much. You know, we all, we see all these exciting, like, oh, we scaled up and you see amazing performance with uncurated data. That's not the full story. Um, oftentimes those results, you know, even clip and so on, there's a lot of curation that went in behind the scenes. Like a clip, I, I think there was eight months, maybe, of data curation to that part of the project. Um, and so, you know, how to obtain methods that generally learn good representations of multiple levels of extraction on, on, on uh, uncurated data, I, I think that's an open question, but I think it's important to address because the point of uh, self-supervised learning is really want to scale and, you know, we want to do that with uncurated data. Uh, so that's all I have for today. Yeah, I mean, the papers and the code are both available online. Uh, actually, if you have any questions, you can post an issue in the GitHub or you can directly email me. Uh, actually, maybe uh, I'll share my email after. And yeah, happy to chat with anyone. That's all I have for today. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, yeah, these ones? Uh, yeah, I just, uh, I probably missed, I'm sure you said this, but mm. so you take the prototypes, because the diffusion model isn't part of the training at all, you have to use architecture. So, like, no. I'm sure it's not, you, just, you don't just like plug in place and condition things, right? You're like, how do you train, how do you fine tune that diffusion model on yeah. the vertex? Yeah, so um, actually this diffusion model is trained to do reconstruction on ImageNet. Right. Um, so that's, uh, you can check the paper uh, by Fabian. Uh, you know, it, it's a really interesting paper. It's, um, you know, it's a way to visualize. I think oh. the way they uh, propose it is a way to visualize your self-supervised representation or in general, but you can use it to visualize any representation. Do you compare the results to like random vectors, I guess? Uh, like, like, oh, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. So the diffusion gets really good at kind of reconstructing and generating diverse samples. And then what we do is we freeze that network pre trained on ImageNet. And then you now do inference. Uh, so it's frozen, it's not learning, but you do inference, but conditioned on a separate vector. Mm -hmm. And based on that, you get different kind of generations. So if you were to condition on a random vector, yeah. you would not get you would not get like something semantically unique. But that's interesting because there's no reason to think that the representation of the values of the should have anything to do with like the space of the device that we're using. Like why yeah. should that be the case? Yeah. Um, yeah. Again, we'll, maybe uh, we'll look at the, the RCM yeah, paper. Yeah. 
like maybe I should clarify. Actually, it's trained to do reconstruction um, on the pre-trained model. You see, so it's it learns to map those representations and reconstruct the original image. So you take like any pre-trained model. Say you have a self-supervised model uh, that's pre-trained. Yeah. You freeze it, extract the representations, and you know the images to which they correspond. Right. And then you train it to do um, uh, reconstruction there, okay. conditioned on that. Um, I should double check with you, but I'm pretty sure that's what you do. And then uh, what you do is you freeze it, and then you look at new images, test images that you have never um, reconstructed or generated. Yeah. Compute those representations and see what uh, you, you see what I mean. Yes, I see what you're saying. That makes sense. There's a risk that you need to plan out. Maybe the three months have to generate the photo. Uh, yeah, it could be, but the thing is, you don't see that. Um, like for example, here, you know, you you see that it's um, obviously it's good at generating photorealistic images, but if your conditioning does not have any information in it, it doesn't. Uh, and actually, but that that's um, I'd say that's that goes into the work here. I think you know they did work too. Yeah, they figured out. <laughs> we benefited from this, but they figured it out. I mean, so. for, for your case, kind of the point of the prototypes is that mm -hmm. you're saying even when you train this visualization with your actual representations, representations exactly, then the prototypes have learned stuff that is meaningful mm -hmm. in comparison to that to the point you can decode to these. Exactly. So it was it was the diffusion model was was trained to reconstruct training images, uh, conditioned on image representations. Uh, is never seen prototypes at all, but they live in the same space, right? Because here, you know, representations and prototypes live in kind of the same space. Because you're doing the same attention. Like exactly. Yes, yeah, exactly. Soft so, uh, yeah, it's just directly, you know, it's uh, measure the cosine, feed it through soft max. So they live in the same space. So in principle, it's possible to do this. Um, and thing is, you don't get this with all methods. So we tried with other methods, self-supervised methods, um, like BICREG and so on. Uh, you don't get this kind of class alignment of this last layer of prototypes. Having said that, um, also, I think a criticism of self-supervised methods, I think a lot of these methods are actually doing something very similar. And I do think they all kind of learn class-specific features to some extent. It's just some of them are not access aligned. They're very rotated. Maybe if you did a kind of PCA, you took the principal uh, components, and then you, know, you rotated everything and your representations, and then this, I think maybe you would see. Um, I actually wanted to do that, but I haven't had a chance yet. Mm -hmm. uh, oh yeah. The, the, you go back to the paper. Because I have the yeah. So, oh yeah. This one. Uh, so over here, the prediction number of classes is the same as number of the right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So this is you know if you have twenty thousand prototypes, this here is a, a vector, a twenty thousand dimensional vector, but in the simplex, right? It's yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, yeah. And again, I think the main thing here is the masking. Um, I think that's what gives us big gains, but um, also hurts performance on instance-based tasks because you're discarding a lot of information. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry to harp on the last point. Sure. What is it? Uh, what does it mean mechanically to condition on the representation when you're doing the reconstruction? Maybe. Uh, yeah. It's it's not okay. So it's imagine a model yeah. that you know is given a representation and is trained to output uh, you know, the image used to produce that representation, okay? Um, so now, uh, imagine you don't have the image anymore, you're done training, you give it a representation, and you see the output of that model, and that's a way to kind of just reverse the process. So imagine a decoder. You can yeah. think of it as kind of a decoder, but that's generating diverse samples. Just really want to see the results from random vectors. Yeah, okay. Random vectors, mm, right? Yeah. Because uh, it's like basically you're, I, I'm sure that there's some improvement, right? Because the space is just like organized from representation into space, but I just view it as like a better initialization in a way. Uh, yeah, but um, again, it comes down to the details of how they're trained. Like, I think you're right. You can imagine. Where'd you find, I'm not saying like just keep staying with those random ones, but I'm saying like instead of like putting in these conditioning vectors and then you train to the decision file, I'm saying like, what if you also like in this process also learn the prototypes? While you're training your decision model, right? Oh, okay. And so then I think that at that point, it's it's basically like saying, I think that my hypothesis would be this would take a lot longer, but it would probably work somehow. And then this is just like a really, really good initialization towards learning these 
prototypes during the diffusion model training. I see. So you're saying put your diffusion model into the training pipeline, so you train it online along with your that's, objective. That's one way of doing it, but yeah, just the general idea of like learning the prototypes while you're training the diffusion model. Yeah. Okay. So the idea is that then uh, you want the prototypes, and you'd backprop through the prototypes in some yes. way. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So you get some signal from your prototypes using a reconstruction type. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, so that goes along the direction of actually combining, um, and there, there are works doing that. So there's this iBot paper. Uh, iBot, it's not pixel level reconstruction, but what it does, it does this kind of joint embedding architecture loss on the class token, and then it does a patch level reconstruction loss on every single patch. IBOT, it yeah, IBOT, I think, is this a TikTok thing? No, what's it called? Um, <laughs> company that, ByteDance. Oh, ByteDance. Right. Yeah, <laughs> TikTok. <laughs> Yeah, so that that's interesting. Actually, that method um, that method is is pretty good at. I mean, we do outperform iBot for the tasks we look at, but I think in general iBot because it can. Um, my personal opinion, no, but I think because it combines uh, a loss of multiple levels of protection, has a patch level loss, so you tend to learn kind of a lot of instance level features, and it has a global loss. You also learn semantic features, so it actually tends to do pretty well on a variety of tasks. Uh, but in the specific case of like low shot, we did actually much better. But I think I bought, and those kinds of methods are an interesting way to go. Although I think personally, um, I think it's interesting to think about instance-based tasks. So kind of removing the batch component and thinking about methods that literally are given a scene, uh, make predictions about other parts of the scene, from other parts, you know, so you have a context and make predictions about other parts. Um, and maybe you can get a mix of low level and high level features by, you know, the size of the context and predictions. So, you know, if you have a small, so right now the problem with the reconstruction based approach is they're very patch based. You know, it's very, imagine 16 by 16 and that's what you're trying to predict. So of course it's gonna be low level, but imagine based on you know, a slightly larger context, you're trying to predict something about a general part of an image and vice versa. And that might be the, the way to go there, I think. <laughs> yeah. So in the last like more picture that presented, like oh, yeah? there was- uh, Pons, this one? Yeah, yeah. Sure. So, no, yeah, so, in in the architecture, you were like retrieving the y values, right? You know what the y values so because it's a semi system. Uh, exactly. Yeah, and we here you 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 don't know that because it's just like set for patches or and exactly maybe they correspond to some part. I was wondering if it's also possible to learn what classes it corresponds to automatically within the setup. Yeah, so you're so saying like you learn also the values. Yeah, yeah. So um, so right now you can think of mass Siamese networks as saying. Our label, you know, here it's just the identity. All of these prototypes correspond to different classes. Yeah. But if you think of it as attention and think of your prototypes as the keys, you also want to learn kind of the value store. Yeah. Uh, I think that's interesting and possible. But then the kind of uh, non collapsing theoretical guarantees we have don't, uh, I don't think they would hold anymore. Uh, so you just need to make sure you prevent collapse, you need to prevent the network from not putting a comment. But I think that's interesting because then maybe, maybe that's actually a way to generalize it and learn. Um, you know, not just you know class information or higher level information, but relate kind of concept classes at multiple different levels of abstraction. Right. So maybe you have like multiple hierarchies of labels, and these are learned, and actually that could be interesting ways to explore those kinds of yeah. But then you have to be careful about collapse because my uh, intuitively I'm I'm not sure. Maybe you could be just like a heuristic way you make sure the gradient dynamics don't go in that direction, and that's actually seems to be the trend a lot of methods are taking these days. You know, there isn't like principal theoretical guarantees that we're not going to collapse, but in practice, you know, it's probably not going to collapse. Uh, so maybe there's a way to do it in the day. The crossing fingers. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I, I heard, I don't know if this is true, but I know people working on, on this direction that, uh, you know, their thought was that actually, if you do train it long enough, that do I or these things, they actually will collapse. But, you know, we just stop way before that point. So you end up in this configuration where you actually have good representation. But if you were to take it, yeah, because you didn't take it to the end. And it's the idea that maybe one is network is changing at a much different rate than the other. So that's what's preventing you. There's also this paper by uh, Yuan Dong and other colleagues at Meta. Uh, maybe Surya and Dong, I guess I should double check, but um, uh, kind of looking at why non contrastive methods that don't have any kind of repulsive, like do I well, maybe why they don't collapse. And they have some theoretical intuitions. Uh, for one, for instance, like the MRP, like you know that projector, uh, you know it's biased in a certain way. If you look at the dynamics, it's biased to um, you know, a certain rank subspace of some kind, and that's what prevents it from collapse. So there is some work trying to theoretically understand it, but it's um, 
just also, you know, on the other hand, it, there are some assumptions there, like simplifying assumptions to that kind of analysis. Mm -hmm. I had a question. Sorry. Is the regularization like saying that? Yeah, that's what the regularization okay. is saying. The regularization is just saying we want to use all the prototypes on average. Um, okay. So that that's this maximized entropy of average prediction. Um, so that's what makes sure that these prototypes kind of try and at least do something different, but it doesn't guarantee it, obviously. Uh, sorry, there was another question from the mm -hmm. Yeah, um, can you hear? I'm remote. Uh, yes, I can hear. Okay, I had a question about uh, masking strategy. It seems randomizing the masking, uh, independent of the amount, uh, ignores things like the fact that particularly in curated data, you typically have a foreground uh, background uh, focused type uh, imagery is what what uh, what is the state of the art of controlling the masking in order to take advantage of things like uh, image composition? Uh, yeah, really interesting. You mentioned that. Um, I believe there is some related work. Uh, actually, I think could be wrong. Maybe it's a little bit older than the MAE paper. So I think it predated the MAE paper. Uh, I could share it. I don't remember the exact title of the paper, but I believe there is work looking at controlling the level of masking based on, you know, trying to do it more intelligently based on the content and semantic content of the image and, and things like that. So there are ways to do it more intelligently. And actually, I'm sure, uh, I'm sure integrating those kinds of approaches would lead to improvements. Um, this was kind of just a first step and heuristically kind of tuning the masking based on your model capacity and your patch size seem to be doing okay. But again, there are limitations. Like I said, this is ImageNet based pre training. And so maybe you know, your masking ratios you want to recalibrate for different data sets. Uh, or alternatively, if you find a general way to do the masking, but in a more intelligent way, uh, maybe then you just have one strategy that works across multiple different kinds of data sets that doesn't need to be recalibrated. Uh, but the heuristic was you mask based on capacity of your model and the patch size. So smaller patch sizes means you should mask more, randomly drop more patches. And bigger models have more capacity, so also kind of heuristic was mask them. Thank you. And we have some relations on these things in the in the paper as well. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, can can I have a question? Go ahead. Yeah. So I yeah previously you mentioned that uh the two methods that yeah is uh good at uh different number. Uh, using different number of labels yeah for low shot training so the first method is good at 100 labels for each class and the, the second method is good at uh, even low shot setting even one shot mm. uh, one shot uh, labels for each class so i'm wondering why the second method is better than the first method is it because mm. the second method has stronger representation learning uh, yeah Really good question. Um, I think the intuition comes down to something as simple as, as overfitting. Um, you know, the first method is great, but because you're still getting gradient signal with respect to your labeled images, even though you don't directly have a supervised loss, uh, you're still prone to overfitting in that case. Um, uh, just because you know you don't have a lot of labeled images in your in your in your support set. Um, so you know, overfitting is not a problem if you have enough images. And it tends to do very well in that setting. But you go to the extremely low shot setting, overfitting is a problem. So now how do you get around that? And that's, I think, this area where mass signings networks works really well because it doesn't use any labeled images during pre-training. Um, so it, we kind of mitigate that risk. And even for evaluation, right? Um, you know, with one image per class, how do you fine tune like a VIT large with very small patch size? Yeah. You know, maybe it's possible if you throw a lot of data augmentations and you know all these kinds of regularizations like path drop and all these things. Uh, maybe it's possible, uh, but it's easier just to freeze the network and just train a logistic regression class right on top. So yeah. it really took the approach of saying we don't even want to touch the weights of the network with labeled images, um, and that's what makes it good at this extremely low shot setting with big models. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. Uh, yeah. I think in your first method, you you're saying that you are uh, using the few short samples during training. So how about uh, using the learnable prototype in, uh, in your first method? In this way, we can 
uh, maybe you can use the similar training paradigm for low trust setting first pre training on uh, on super large scale of on uh, on yeah. data and then doing the fine tuning. Yeah, actually, we, we did talk about that. We didn't do it for some reason, just didn't get to it. But I think that's really interesting. So you're suggesting pre train your network in an unsupervised fashion. Yes. And then fine tune it in this way with this non parametric semi supervised loss. Is, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And we were compelled to do that. We thought it might push the numbers a bit and then just, you know, things got busy and ran out of time. But I I okay. think that was an interesting direction. We actually did talk about, I have no idea why we didn't do it. Um, but I think it's interesting to also look at this as a potential method for fine tuning your model in extremely low shot uh, settings. Uh, but again, I think the interesting thing is taking these kinds of methods beyond image classification and taking them beyond representations of, you know, just a high semantic level that's good at classification. And thinking about how do you get you know, multiple different levels of features in your representation uh, and also how to leverage those, right? Because if you have too many <laughs> features in your representation and then you try and do a low shot task, you can still overfit. So you need a way. Um, okay, so just as an example, I'm not saying this is the way to go, but imagine you were able to get good structure in your representation, um, you know, such that the features were disentangled. Then maybe, for instance, you can take a task and you say, I know I only need to rely on a small set of features, so I'm going to impose a sparsity prior. And that way you can kind of selectively just pick a handful of features for your task. And because it's factored, you're good at like semantic abstraction, you're good at these instance based methods and so on. Um, yeah, I don't know if that's the way to go, but I think thinking more generally about how to structure your representations while still adding features at multiple levels, I, I think that's the interesting thing. And that when thinking about extensions and how to build on this, uh, these are the kinds of approaches I would think of is how to introduce hierarchical representations and these kinds of things, and even move beyond the data augmentations. Um, you know, we know they're good for certain tasks, but these handcrafted data augmentations hurt for others. Uh, masking, uh, what's attractive, particularly attractive about masking is not just the computational benefits, but that it provides, you know, a more kind of domain agnostic data augmentation that you can think of applying to other modalities. So obviously we've seen this in, in, uh, in natural language. Right, um, so I think masking also is a potential way to kind of move beyond handcrafted data augmentations. Another thing that I think would allow you to move beyond handcrafted data augmentations are doing instance-based prediction, but not at a patch by patch level reconstruction. Right now, imagine you're, um, you know, for example, imagine, and this is what people do in speech, for instance, right? Imagine you have a video um, and you wanna do kind of representation learning in a contrastive way. You can choose your negative samples to come, for example, from the same video, and maybe a you know, longer, you know, not super close to your current frame. Uh, and that way, the model is not going to be able to use like, uh, because really, like we need color jitter, not because it's it's useful to uh, be invariant to to this, but because otherwise the model kind of learns to cheat and use first order color statistics to solve this task. So really, the only one that I would say is important is really the cropping or random resize cropping. The rest are kind of just there to slightly improve performance or avoid these kinds of pathological solutions. Now you can imagine if you're doing prediction at multiple scales, you're kind of getting the same effect as cropping. And if you can make sure that, you know, whatever training setup you have doesn't have these pathological solutions, you know, then you can completely get rid of uh, these handcrafted data augmentations. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so... Uh, <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.